Binder adjustment is like a whole fucking class. Right, I'm having almond okay. butter and banana. <laughs> what a pair. <laughs> Please be advised that this episode of Caution includes descriptions and mentions of childhood trauma, corporal punishment, slut shaming, protecting honor, isolation, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexualizing children, rebellion, unrealistic expectations, domestic violence, controlling behavior, dismissive behavior, silent treatment, walking on eggshells, hierarchical family roles, marginalization, and forced obedience. We highly encourage our audience to review our trigger guide for self-care at healtoend.org slash caution. At this point, I was about 15 because it was just before I ran away from home. I really wanted to go to this party that was actually in the neighborhood, probably like a block away, and everybody was going. We knew about this party like two or three months in advance. Prior to this, my mother had given me some ridiculous thing, like saying, if you want to go anywhere, you're going to have to tell me at least a month in advance so that I can consider it. And I knew that it was crap, but then I was like, fine, what could I say? But now here's this party. I already know three months in advance. I tell my mother, the moment that I knew about the party, I talked to my mother literally every week, reminding her that the party was coming up and what date it was and that who was going and the people's names and the address to the place it was, just all details. And she would feel like, okay, up until the day of the party, where I say, mom, I'm going to Graham, which is the place where we all went to go like shopping for very affordable clothes. It's the area. I said, I'm going to go to Graham, get some clothes, and I'm going to get my hair done for tonight, you know, for the party. She's like, está bien, okay, fine. I go, I come back, my hair is dead. I have a really nice outfit. I go get dressed and I'm about to leave. She's in the living room and I'm like, okay, mommy, bye. I see you later. And she's like, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm going, I'm going to the party. And she's like, what party? The fact that she asked me that question enraged me. And I'm like, the party that I was telling you about? And inside my heart is pounding and I'm just trying to talk specifically the right way that she taught me how to talk to her because she would not listen. She completely shut down if I didn't say or use the perfect words. So I was like, you know, mommy, the party, the party that I was telling you about. And she's like, hmm. I never said you could go. This was the first time in my life that I spoke back to my mother. I said, no. I said, Ma, I told you. You told me if I talked to you and I did everything you told me to do. I did everything you told me to do. And she basically turned it around and said I was being disrespectful to her. And we got into it and she beat the living shit out of me. She was literally pulling my hair and beating me up, having an asthma attack while she's doing it. And my brother walks in, sees what's happening, stops my mother and is like, what the hell? I got up and I said, you know, forget it. I went to my room and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I kept thinking to myself, why? <laughs> I asked myself that question so many times when I was growing up. In Iran, cousins, you could potentially be in a relationship with them or marry them. So because of that, the way that touch and contact is managed between opposite sex cousins, it's not like the same way I would interact with my brother. So we are on vacation with my aunt's family and it must have been 12, 13-ish. There's six, seven kids and adults and we've rented this house that has maybe a bedroom or two. So not enough for everybody to have their own space. We basically have our sleeping bag and everything on the floor next to each other to get the kids in bed. Bedtime comes and as soon as the places are made and I am told here is the spot I'm supposed to be sleeping in, I go diving, crashing, and I'm just putting my head down to just go. A few minutes into me sleeping, my father wakes me up. He's like, you can't sleep there. I was just like, why the fuck not? I was asleep already, first of all, and I am so tired. Like, you do not understand who you're talking to right now. <laughs> I was so pissed that he had just woken me up. I'm like, why not? And he tells me that I couldn't sleep there because my male cousin, who was like 
a decade older than me, was going to be sleeping here, head here, body here. This is me sleeping here, head here, body here, on pillows. And we're all fully clothed. And so his reasoning is I need to move and find a different place to sleep because my male cousin has decided now he's sleeping here. And in my head, I'm trying to understand the reasoning behind this. So he wants to sleep here. You think this is inappropriate. Okay, I don't understand why you think this is inappropriate, but you think this is inappropriate. And so I have to get up, find a different place. <laughs> yes, and I am already asleep. He hasn't even gone to bed. He's planning on sleeping there. I'm just like, why? What the fuck? Like, what is happening right now? So I talk back. I tell him that I don't give a shit. I don't care he's sleeping there. I just want to sleep. I'm just sleeping. I don't want to do anything. I am like, what are you thinking? Why are you bothering me? And he gets really pissed off. And every time I think back about this, I think about how this is my aunt's family, my uncle, my cousin. And he was put in a position of asserting his control and masculinity over me in that position. I was talking back to him openly. So he loses his shit and he starts yelling at me and calling me all sorts of names and telling me how I'm a stupid. He didn't say slut exactly, but it was really understood in the way he was talking to me. I am a disgrace to the family who doesn't have honor, who's not modest. And how dare I talk back and how dare I not obey and just would not stop. He was just really going at it. And I got up, I went to one of the rooms, I got in this position in the corner and I was just crying while he was literally standing there yelling at me very loudly for a while. I cried myself to sleep. Nobody ever checked in with me that night. Nobody ever talked about it with me the next day. There was this thing that was in the air. I don't know if anybody talked to him, but it was just kind of like, what did you expect? You stood up to your father and he had a point clearly that I did not understand. He was right. I wasn't stupid. I did not understand it. I still do not understand it. But I really think about the dynamic of what happened for him to get to that point of feeling like he had to control me in such a traumatic way mm -hmm. in order to keep his family honorable and safe. I'm assuming that was the thought process, if there was any. Was your body movement or relationships ever controlled in your family in the name of protecting your honor or preventing violence? I don't think I've ever heard my mother apologize. Even when she outwardly was not in the right, next day we wake up and it's like, boom, we're just existing. If you're thinking you're gonna get an apology, you're absolutely wrong. I have the right to do this and you don't get to question this. I actually don't have to apologize because this is part of my job. There are some ways in which parents try to control you, like never apologizing. That's part of asserting dominance yeah. is that I am above you. There is a clear hierarchy here. When I make mistakes, I do not apologize to you. Right. When you make mistakes, you apologize to me. And even when you don't make mistakes, you apologize to me. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm never questioned because there is an overall understanding as parent, I am totality. I make all the rules. And not all parents are like this, but it's normalized. And that is not normal. Controlling parents go through life shifting the way they control us. As young children, their control often looks like physical course, either beating you or physically controlling your body, locking the door, stopping you from going places, dictating you to basically do what they want you to do. And when you're very little, of course, that's very easy. But as you grow older and that kind of physical control becomes more difficult, then they start dismissing, they don't like the things you do. So mm -hmm. instead of maybe telling you don't go to this party, they diminish and dismiss the party in, in its entirety. Instead mm -hmm. of telling you they don't like you to be doing art and rather you focus on your studies, for example, that was my experience, is mm -hmm. they just, they diminish right. the thing you're interested in and they elevate, they think they're interested in. It's all part of a pattern of just not seeing who you are right. and only being focused on how they're feeling about who you are and how they're feeling about what they want you to do. And then you grow older, perhaps you leave the house, you have more control over your life, you don't depend on them more. And that's especially when behaviors like silent treatment becomes very popular. Yeah. The controlling parent doesn't have a lot of emotional and physical control over you anymore. I will not 
be in relationship basically with you. I will not connect with you. I will give you silent treatment. I will be passive aggressive. That's the space I'm in currently with my mother as an adult. It's the silent treatment. And the power struggle, it continues. You said something like being so careful how you say things, how you behave, following the rules, trying to first of all, understand the rules and then follow them, hoping that maybe you can get this relationship right. Mm-hmm. And what's been so liberating for me is realizing that I cannot control the relationship just by myself. Same here. I felt like I was carrying the weight of the relationship that I wanted with my mother. That if I did everything exactly the way she told me, then everything would be fine. But that day never came. It was never okay. So my emotions were controlled all the time. If we go out, my mother would be like, this is the way you behave. If we were laughing too much, she'd be like, stop laughing. If I was standing there just like this, she's like, smile, smile, stop looking like you're upset. There was a point in my life where I started being a wise ass because I was all, because I'm like, how am I supposed to act? Should I smile? Should I be sad? Should I smile? Should I be sad? Because I had to check in with my mom to be like, how should I behave? What makes a controlling parent so insidious is that the domination usually comes in the guise of concern. Phrases such as, this is for your own good. I'm only doing this for you. And only because I love you so much, all mean the same thing. I'm doing this because I'm so afraid of losing you that I'm willing to make you miserable. The difference between a family that questions control and works through it in a different way than a family that uses control for whatever reasons. The difference between being a dysfunctional family and then being uh, sustainable. A lot of families are like that. You grow older and it's like, yeah, I have no connection to my brother or my siblings rather than not controlling over developing relationships naturally and then seeing where it may fall. Uh, do, Do we have a connection and staying in contact, having that sustained ability based on actual relationship, based on actual caring and love, not the subscribed thing. I am your mother. Therefore, this is my role. You are my child. This is your role. These are the things you are supposed to do. These are the things I'm supposed to do no matter what, no matter the emotion. This is my job. And I think that's a disservice because it locks people into certain jobs that possibly they don't want. They never want it or don't fit, but we continue to stuff ourselves into that because that is the role that was given to us. And then everybody suffers for that because nobody wants to be there. Those roles that we craft for ourselves and others are a substitute for having a relationship Mm -hmm. because when you are actually in relationship with someone, you get to be vulnerable and you allow them to be vulnerable. In a relationship where there are roles determined and there are unwritten in rules, unspoken rules of who gets to do what, then you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to actually sit down and listen to what this person's needs and desires are, where they are at today and their emotions are. You do the thing, you follow the script. And a lot of folks, especially parents, they are emotionally exhausted. They most likely did not grow up in families where their emotions as children were considered. So it is scary to try to step into a place of vulnerability, which is required for making a genuine connection with anybody. And I think we take it for granted. A lot of parents, I feel like, have this expectation. I should have a great relationship with my child because I did so much for them and that this is my child and I would do anything for them and I love them endlessly. But why isn't my child in a close relationship with me? Why don't we have the kind of close heart to heart thing happening? And I always wonder why do they expect that to happen just because they're the parent or that they have this bond that has been set in stone. There's nothing inherently intimate or connective about the relationship between a parent and child, it is what we make it. It follows the same fucking rules of any other human connection. If you cannot be vulnerable with your child and the child does not get to be vulnerable with you, you will not have a close connection with the child. It's just not going to be the case. And it's interesting always to me why folks feel like the label we give to the relationship will bring out the nature of the relationship as opposed to Well, no, it's just your human and the other person's human. And it's actually just the same thing. If you do not respect the other person, if you try to control them, if you do not care for their emotions, if you cannot be vulnerable with them, you do that with anybody. You're not going to get a good relationship. (laughs) These are the containers we build of obligation. I hear a lot of people, when I get older, my children are going to take care of me. And I have to say within POC communities, a lot of people take care of their older parents, even if they never had a relationship with them. And I think this is about culturally and it stems from shame and obligation. 
again, back to the why parents or adults having to really get to a place where we shine a mirror onto ourselves and really ask, why do I do this? Why do I do it this way? Because when we talk about things are so ingrained, that means that we don't even notice it, that we actually think that this is the way, this is the formula. Because we all have a formula. We know this unwritten rule formula thing about relationships, getting married, having a house, having children. We all know it. Even people who don't believe in it sometimes slide into it because everyone supports that kind of life. And it's so much easier to get into that. And so it is work to shine that mirror onto ourselves. And I'd have to say it's probably even more work for people who are living in the margins and living more oppressed lives because of the oppression that is happening and lack of resources. Sometimes it makes it very difficult to even see that because you're too busy trying to survive. You're too busy trying to just make it in the world. We started off with control of us as children because that's very easy to see because kids, children, young people do not have power in this world. But I think about the whole cycle of this control in terms of the control we have to have of ourselves in order to get to a place where we are desirable for a partner so that we can get to the place of possibly getting to that family. I say this all the time because I never forgot it from college. Never allow your goals to become your masters because when you allow your goals to become your master, that is the only thing you see and you miss everything else. So I think that because the goal is family, because of what? Because of the system we live in because we need to have good jobs and health care. We're in a rat race. We forget what it actually takes to be a family. We miss a lot of steps in the, the true cultivation of even questioning what kind of family do I want? What is this family? Who am I? What kind of partner do I want? And so forth and so on. We're talking about control makes a family, but it really starts from the self. We think if we control our bodies and our sexuality, of course, a subconscious process, we've learned to do that through shame. Shame helps us control our otherwise wild and out of control, I guess, sexuality and body. I'm going to give you underhanded shame right there. Oh, oh, take that shit so that maybe you won't have sex. <laughs> I think the very fact that we feel like there are parts of ourselves that we need to be controlling in order to be desirable and suitable for yeah. potential partners. The control of bodies and sexualities extend from the self into how we expect that from our partners and do it to our partners. Anything from feeling like your partner should not be masturbating now that they are partnered with you. Even if you don't want to see it, you don't want to be around it, you don't want to hear about it, or you have feelings about maybe you're not good enough if your partner is masturbating. It's become so fetishized. Control in partnerships has become part of the fetish of ownership in partnerships, that this is how I know you love me. This is how I know you care about me is if you try to control me. It kind of extends from there into controlling the bodies of children and controlling the sexualities of children, as opposed to seeing them where they are and how they're developing. We have completely accepted that parents get to do all sorts of things to their children's body and the way they understand their body. I'm not talking about parents who are explicitly sexually abusive. I'm talking about the average parent yeah. who overrides their child's agency and autonomy, yes. that who overrides their child's desires, fantasies, and the process of exploration in order to understand how their body sits in this world and interacts with the world around it. Simple things like telling a child what they can and cannot wear and how they can and cannot dress themselves, to me, is sexualizing behavior on part of their parents to their children. And it is about controlling them through having put the shame inside them from a young age. Then we talk about all sorts of controlling behavior through dismissing or diminishing their desires and interests yeah. in order to get them to fall in line. Talking to a kid about, okay, what's going on emotionally right now? Or here is the information that I have, you don't have, I'm going to give it to you. That is breaking that dominance, that is breaking through that control and power that you have over the child. And I think that's part of why a lot of parents are scared of engaging with that process, because that means giving up their control. That can be really scary 
to do that. And I do think withholding information, especially withholding information about the reality of life, bodies, sexualities, all the things that parents think they're protecting children from. You don't have to be explicit about the details of it, but withholding information and making it known to the child, there is information I have, you don't, and you don't get to have it because I said so. That by itself is an act of assertion of dominance. It's an act of control. It's reminding the child who's in charge and the hierarchy that exists in this relationship. A 2022 poll showed that one in five American parents do not plan on talking to their children about sex at all. The same poll indicated that 60% of parents were raised thinking sex was taboo. Going to the root of why anybody feels the need to control or engage in controlling behavior. And I say this from personal experience because mm-hmm. I know I have engaged in plenty of controlling behaviors myself. And when I really look at it, I'm honest with myself about why that is. When I notice my desire for controlling myself and others shows up, it is to me directly connected with times when I feel out of control, I become hyper aware of how there isn't really true safety and security in this world. And there isn't. I mean, the truth is that there just isn't. The sooner you accept that there is no security guaranteed for any of us, the easier it becomes. And that's really difficult for a lot of, especially people who survive trauma, because essentially that trauma has broken your trust and your connection to yourself and others. So now you're in the state of trying to prevent that through controlling yourself, control other people. So when I'm more anxious, when I'm more triggered, when I'm activated, those are the times where I become more controlling. Mm -hmm. And we talked about fear last time. And I think it's that fear that drives the controlling behavior because parents live in this state of fearfulness around their children's, you know, destiny or well-being or whatever, and also their, their own. And they feel like control, maybe make it better. And it just doesn't. It always backfires. When we think about control in the family, when I think about it in this micro sense, it's about efficiency. I'm working a very high demanding job or two jobs. I'm taking care of children, whether you're a partner or not, I don't care. It's hard to raise children. So it's like you're doing all of these things and it is really so much simpler if things were efficient. And so sometimes these controlling mechanisms are about efficiency. And I understand them. Now, this is not even demonizing because we live in this society that makes it so easy to do it that way because it's harder because you don't have the time sometimes or you think you don't have the time or the resources or the information or the support even to do it differently. And we have to think about this in harm reduction approaches as well. Some of us have much more privilege in our resources and what we have and how we could think about our position and our power and control in the world. And some of us don't. Surveys show that 85% of parents feel rushed all or some of the time, and many report parenting to be tiring and stressful. When asked about financial status, only one-third of parents said that they live comfortably. We do such a disservice because the family unit has so much beautiful power to do so many beautiful things. And what it does is it really strips away the important tools we need to actually have healthy relationships in controlling our emotions and controlling our bodies. We never actually get to the whole journey or process of experiencing what it feels like to do anything because what they do is they just tell you. Oftentimes, because we already know, we know what's best. We get into a role of just listen to what I'm telling you. Don't do this. Don't do that. Just listen. You don't have to understand. I'm protecting you. And that's so confusing because it's a different conversation when you're actually asking, why do you feel that way? Describe that. If you could draw it, what would it look like? If you could color it, what would it look like? Imagine what kinds of expressions of emotions would we cultivate with young people if we talked in that manner, not in the, I already know what this is going to look like. I already know what life's ailments are. So let me just cut to the chase for you. And I know where it comes from in terms of protection. But when I think of life, the actuality of life is that that is our right. Our right is to live and make lots of mistakes. (laughs) 
<laughs> and then choose whether to go this way or that way from that mistake. It, it is literally our right. And as children, that right is completely taken away from us because we don't get to make those mistakes. And we learn early on, don't fuck up rather than oh, it's okay that you made that mistake. Now, what can we learn from that mistake? We are learning the wrong messages and all of the key things that I think we try to search for learning as adults when we do self-help and all that stuff is the shit we should have learned when we were fucking kids. The controlling behavior starts from the self into partnership and families. And it also starts from the top, from the state and comes down through institutions and the systems to us. I think for a lot of people, they're not allowed to make mistakes in a society that doesn't have room for you to be fully human. To me, that's at the core of not recognizing someone's agency, dignity, and humanity is not letting them make mistakes, yes. or punishing them disproportionately for the mistake. I'm not saying mistakes should not have consequences. Mm -hmm. I just feel like there are consequences of mistakes for some are non-existent and for others are completely disproportionate. Yes. And when you are marginalized, in any way, including being a child in a family, then the consequences of your mistakes are very, very harsh. So that means you are not really allowed to make mistakes. That means you don't really get to be fully human. And so the cycles continue. You don't get to be fully human. So your children don't get to be fully human. So your partners don't get to be fully human. And the system doesn't want you to be fully human. The system wants you to be exploitable. And if you're fully human, it is much, much harder to exploit you. And we talk a lot about how a lot of the grooming behaviors that lead to sexual violence in childhood and adulthood, they start from the family. The normalization of controlling behaviors through our caregivers, our teachers, our whatever ministers, whoever we consider authority as a child, if that is normalized as part of how we experience connection and care, that will continue into our adult life. Research shows that parental psychological control undermines autonomy and predicts unfavorable outcomes well into adulthood, impacting maturity, romantic relationships, and academic success, to name a few. I think about any time I hear of when young people are vying and going against their families, it's always this horribly negative thing, but really it's about them trying to find their own agency. It's always about that. Hear me out. They're always fighting to get their own agency because if they had the natural process to do it, that wouldn't be the case. When that is happening, to me, it almost feels like an erupting volcano because we've been controlled so much that once we finally have that freedom, we go berserk. And I did. I was like, I'm free. I'm going out. And then, of course, I didn't have any information about what this freedom was. So there began the multiple mistakes that I had to go through. I didn't have to go through it as hard as I did if I would have had the information. To me, that's a telltale sign of having grown up with controlling caregivers is one of these two behaviors, the child who is always obeying, who is always looking at others for answers and what they are doing, and the child who's always rebelling. Both of those, it's different outward behaviors, but at the root of the both of those is not knowing what it is you really want. Yeah. and what actually works for you. And the child who doesn't know that is always going to be either looking for somebody else to give them the answers and obey whatever somebody else leads and they follow, or the child who, instead of, again, considering what is it they want, they look at what is the authority saying, do exactly the opposite. Neither of them is authentic behavior because you do not know yourself. You do not know what works for you. You're just going off of what do I do to either piss this person off who's trying to control me or calm this person who's trying to control me. It continues from caregivers to our partners and yeah. friends. Even our work environment, it can yeah. ripple. Because I think there is this idea of the obeying child being idealized. Oh, I've got the best child who just always does what I say. That's not good. That child is in danger. Best case scenario, you are a wonderful parent who would never do anything harmful to the child, but a child who always obeys you is a prime target for manipulators and abusers who are happy to take advantage of that quality of not knowing your own boundaries, not knowing your own needs, not being in tune with all of that. We talk a lot about the importance of building good relationships with children as the most important preventative measure because 
CSA is never about the direct abuser, especially CSA that was ongoing, that happened domestically. I'm not talking about the one-time stranger situation, which is very few cases of CSA. When you talk about CSA that happens domestically by people you know and is an ongoing thing, the direct abuser harm doer is one piece of the puzzle in that situation. And I think what we don't think about is the conditions that make that abuse possible. And one of them is the kind of grooming process we go through by not learning what is the proper form of relating in our families of origin. When we don't learn that, we don't know what that looks like, then we become targets for abuse in our childhood, in our adulthood, young adulthood, all of that. So that's the part that's not talked about because I have a really hard time imagining a child who has any sense of their own boundaries and their autonomy and what is okay and not okay, tolerating or putting up with an ongoing abuse situation. I just cannot imagine it. Or not disclosing that to someone as soon as the first signs of it happen. Mm -hmm. Because an ongoing harm doer, they are banking on, they're bidding on that child's lack of capacity to speak up. They're banking on that child's lack of capacity to do anything back, to speak back, to protect themselves. And when the child does not have those tools, that's when that happens. You know the look of the controlling mother. No words need to be even spoken. Oh, no. I wish I could stand and show you how my mother, with her hands behind her back, let me see. She's so short too. But she always comes down to your level where you're sitting and just like puts her face right in your face. Like, mm-hmm. Thank you.